It's time to get inside the Giants huddle. Huddle up, huddle up, huddle up. On Giants.com. Here we go, here we go. And the Giants mobile Get them in there, let's go. Part of the Giants podcast network. Welcome to another edition of the Giants huddle podcast. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Giants playing in Dallas 430 on Thursday. So an abbreviated week as we get you ready for kickoff. Just a reminder, the Giants Little Podcast is brought to you by PSENG, energy efficiency for game time and anytime. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. All right, pack show today. I'm going to talk to Mark Lewinsky, Giants offensive lineman. Lance Beto and Paul Dottino preview the Cowboys. They go under the hood down in Big D with Cowboys play-by-play voice Brad Sham. And then Bob Papa sits down with Giants head coach Brian Dable. And don't forget, folks, go back on your Giants little podcast feed. The prior episode, Bob Papa talks to Eli Manning about the Giants' big win against Dallas uh, in December of 2011, which basically propelled the Giants into the postseason. They would not have made the playoffs without that victory. And, of course, on to a Super Bowl championship. Go back to last week. Uh, my interview with Greg Olson was also really interesting. I suggest you go back and check that out. All right, let's rock and roll. We lead off with my interview with Giants offensive lineman Mark Lewinsky. Mark, how are you, man? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. All right, let, let's get right to it. How much did you guys even go back and like watch the tape last week? You have like two days to get ready. Yeah, I'm saying a lot of it's uh, accountability on ourselves to make sure that we're watching what, you know, right after the game, make sure that we get all the corrections that are needed. And, uh, you know, most of it's uh, if there was any key things that we maybe need to work on or have an emphasis on. But, you know, it, it rolls right into, you know, a short, short week. You know, we have a game on Thursday, so we got to make sure that we're preparing and doing everything that we can and whatever may apply from the last game used. But, you know, we had to just – wipe it clean from that moment what were your takeaways when you had a chance to look at the tape um it just you know the things that we talk about all the time it's it's either we're executing or we're not um you know fundamentals things like that so just making sure that we focus in on all those uh, key things that we talk about all the time um and we you know we just got behind a little bit um so we were probably trying to play catch up Anything Detroit did that was special to s- slow down the running game? I mean, Saquon, it was his lowest yardage total of the year. Um, I think we just didn't execute um, in some moments, and we missed some things that when we you know, look back on film, there was, there was even things that were there, but we just we just didn't go the right direction or so, you know, where there was something maybe open that we just fell right into things that maybe if we had a second chance, we wouldn't have done. Now, you had a lot of guys coming in and out of the lineup, too, right? Tyree Phillips had to leave the game. John Feliciano had to leave the game, which means you had different guys on either side of you and two guys in Nick Gates and Matt Parrott who were talented, but they were hurt in the preseason. So you didn't even get you know spring and summer reps with these guys. So what was it like just trying to get in sync with those guys, with two brand-new guys next to you in the middle of the game? Um, I was actually happy during the week that those guys were actually getting um, splitting reps. So I actually had some feel for that, and uh, I felt comfortable as soon as they come in. But the way that our mentality is next man up, but, you know, that's a big thing is how we can get some of those guys in the rotation, even if they're not showing up on game day, uh, making sure that they're prepared. You know, we're always switching around. We even, you know, like the practices we got now, it's what if situations, maybe give a guy a rep here or there, maybe throw the, get another guy in center because – if one guy goes down, then maybe the you know somebody from guard has to play the other tackle or you know vice versa. So we're always in the rotation of that, and I've had some of the experience, even uh, last season where I've had um, some guys get hurt even when I was on my right side. So I've had the experience to just make sure that you stay with the communication, try to keep it all the same. So when it when it comes to that moment, that you can just just say and do. What can you do this week now? It's a short week. It's walkthrough practices. You're not having real practices. You don't even know who's going to start, right? Tyree Phillips, John Feliciano, as of this recording, are going to be basically game-time decisions. So what can you guys do this week in this walkthrough scenario so that no matter who plays, you're going to be on the same page on Thursday? Um, it's, it's having the game plan and executing what we talk about. Everybody that we're talking about that might be hurt or not, they're all in the same meetings. We're all t- talking the same language. So whoever's in there, that's what's going to happen. You know, that's where we're going to go out there and execute, and that's our plan. So we just got to make sure that we're all on the same page. We're all in the same meetings, communicating with one another regardless. The guy that might be the supposed starter needs to talk to the second and third guy for whatever might happen or if somebody has to go down. So, The Giants have had one of the best run games in the league all year. A lot of that's the offensive line. What, what's clicked? Why has the run game been so effective? Um, I think it's just uh, staying with it, 
even when if you might get a play that might not work out, I think it's just going back to it. I think that's what it really comes down to is trusting it, you know, not getting scared when there might be a bad situation because there's sometimes that the, the defense might just scheme something up where you may have not known or they just fa fall right into something or somebody, you know, whatever happens, it just continue the process of trusting that, uh, you know, trusting the run and having the back be on the same page with us. Yeah, and you guys have had comebacks in the fourth quarter down two scores where, you know, usually teams are throwing the ball in this situation. You guys have had comebacks running the ball. It's, it's something you don't usually see. And as an offensive lineman, you must love that you have coaches that are willing to even stick to the run game when you're down two scores in the fourth quarter, right? Yeah, um, that's what we've talked about all year. Um, you know, going even into OTAs, you know, there was a big emphasis making sure that all the past schemes and everything were in place. But, you know, there was a, there was a big reminder that, when it comes down to it, we may not put as many as much time into it during practice. That's something that we were going to lean on and focus on. So I think it's just keep trusting the process and what we're talking about. Just keep leaning on it um, and setting ourselves up for success. Yeah, and I think there have been games this year where you guys have started slowly, Mark, in the run game, right? But then you've made adjustments, and in the second half, you've done better. Why do you think that you guys have been able to, you know, change or make adjustments or just get better as these games have gone along running the ball? Um, I think it's going to the, you know, there might be certain plays that we figure out they're not going to work the best for us. And it's uh, lining up and seeing what what might have worked or, think, you know, the uh, groupings of plays and making sure that we just continue with those, make sure that we're running the plays that we had success in and setting up off those plays. Yeah, talking to some of your fellow offensive linemen, they've told me this is as big of a, a bag of run schemes that most offenses have, right? You guys will run zone, you'll run gap, you'll run man. Does that give you guys even more options and an ability to adjust during the game when you've practiced all these different schemes and you have so many different things you can go to? Yeah, we we work them countless and just keep running. And, you know, we try to keep a little bit of tempo with those as well just to keep the defenses off guard. Um, but I think it's great to have all those abilities just so that – you know, we might go in the game, like I was saying, and there might be a certain play that they're ready and handled, but they might load up the box in the middle, and then we could be able to do something outside, vice versa, or have a little bit of deception, whatever we have to do. So we have all those plays up every week, um, and we have all those ready to go at any time. Do you, is there a bread and butter run play for you guys this year? Is there a scheme that you think you're – that all right, if we're going to – we need a yard, this is what we're doing. We need a couple yards, this is what we're doing. Or is it really a week-to-week -week based on what the opponent's showing you type of deal? Yeah, I think it really comes down to what the defense is, what the schemes are. Um, you know, there's some moments where you just have to be ready to to get the yard that you need to, regardless of what they're in. Um, you know, sometimes they'll load <laughs> load the whole box up there, but it's like, hey, they might know that we're running that play there, and that's what it is. It's so it's just executing, making sure that we get the pad level and getting those yards when we need them. As a guy that's up front, can you explain for fans the type of impact having a quarterback like Daniel that can keep it? on some of these run plays can have on the defense when you're seeing them scheme and react to what you're doing? Yeah, just what you're saying. Um, there's even times where I'm like, I'm I'm really glad that he took it because they put, <laughs> they had every single guy in there. So, uh, you know, there's times it's, you know, it's having the ability to have a guy that can uh, run and be able to make a play because, you know, there might be a moment where we were like, oh, my goodness, I'm glad that he, t he took off with it because there was an extra guy that they brought from somewhere or a safety or, you know, some blitz. But he was a he, those are the things that he's able to see and he has control of. Is that something you could have went to, you think, a little bit more earlier last week when you saw how much the Lions were, were kind of stacking your, like, primary run, run lanes? Um, it, you know, possibility. But at the time, we're just going out there uh, running the plays that we've, you know, that we designed up. Um, you know, we can always go back and look at things and say, hey, we could have done this. But um, I think it was just making sure that we execute or maybe seeing those things a little bit faster and, and adjusting on the fly. Are you liking New York? Yeah, you having I, fun here? Yeah, I'm saying it's – I'm really happy to be this close to home as well. You know, this it's, it took me, you know, eight years to get within <laughs> under two-hour drive of being home. So it's it's been a great and blessing to have all the resources and different things to do and have them the ability to just jump in the car when we have some time off and just be able to see family or do some kind of event or something like that. So. Is that the plan after Thanksgiving? Uh, yeah, you know, once Thanksgiving, it would be great to be able to just get in the car and, and see and eat some turkey with 
with some uh, family and, and go back. Awesome. Let's talk about the opponent real quick on Thursday, Mark, before we say goodbye. Cowboys, you guys have seen them once this year already. What's the major challenge that their defensive front presents an offensive line? Um, I think it's them having the ability to, uh, you know, once they get in the, in the past situations, to just, you know, create different problems. Um, but I think it really comes down to just making sure that we have a game plan, uh, you know, executing what we see and fundamentals mainly. I'm saying they just got to make sure that we keep the guys in front of us, make sure we're all on the same page. Um, you know, and we got to do our, we got to do whatever we can to just put ourselves in situations to be in, in more manageable downs, which comes into, you know, running situations and starting it off early. So, um, you know, we got to just execute and do what that we're asked of. You know, you talked about the run game. They've had two teams run for over 200 yards against them in the last three weeks. You guys faced them earlier in the year. Um, do you have a pretty good feel of how they're trying to cover the run and, and what some of the things you guys can do to have success in that area without giving away state secrets, of course? Um, yeah, I'm saying there's there's always a plan that we'll have for uh, defenses, and, and we have to make sure that we're ready for whatever that they may throw in. There might be a different personnel that they throw in. So I think it's having the ability to, uh, you know, diagnose what they're – what they're showing and presenting us and and go from there um you know we just you can't just go off one play or two plays that we're going to run i think it's more um you know getting into situations and and being able to diagnose what's going on you mentioned when you get into those third and longs and if you know try not to play from behind but if you are that's when all the twists and stunts come out right they run more twists and stunts than any other team in football according to a lot of the metrics as an offensive line, what do you guys have to do well to deal with all that slants and movements and stuff that they present as a defensive front? Um, just like I said, we got to make sure that we're communicating, make sure we're all in the same, make sure that we're going, you know, the same direction, uh, making sure that we're IDing the guys properly, and making sure that we're just getting a, a good tempo to get it up to the line so that we can see what's in front of us, and uh, and just making sure that we're saying what our fundamentals and all the things that we talk about throughout OTAs up to this point. Final question on the Cowboys. Is this a deal where you get out of the, the huddle and you say, all right, where's 11? Because he can be anywhere, and we got to make sure where this guy is before we you know, get into our snap here. Yeah, um, you know, they have a lot of guys, so I think it's uh, making sure that we're, you know, what we're communicating, making sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and, and just like you said, you have to make sure that you know where he is at all times. But at the same point, we have to make sure that we're blocking the guy that's in front of us because he's not going to be – Every guy's not going to have him, so it, it's it's making sure that we're just lining up and doing the things that we're asked of. Yeah, four players with five plus sacks. They got a bunch of guys. Final question: Are you excited to play on Thanksgiving? Have Have you played on Thanksgiving before? Is Is this like really cool for you? Yeah, it'll be something to definitely notch in the belt. It's something I haven't done, so it'll be great to be able to be one of those three games that it'll be on. And you know, when you go back and. As a kid, uh, this is uh, one of the things I think of is, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're spending time with family and you're watching football games all day. So having the ability to be one of those teams and being on TV, I think, is really cool. Mark, happy Thanksgiving and thanks so much for the time. Best luck against Dallas. Yeah, thank you very much. Happy holidays. Hey, Giant fans, don't miss the second legacy game at MetLife Stadium on Sunday, December 4th. The team will be back in their throwback uniforms from the 80s and early 90s as they host the Washington Commanders. The stadium will be branded in throwback designs, including an exclusive collectible pennant for the first 30,000 fans in attendance. Limited tickets are still available. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat today. All right, now let's check out the Giants opponent this week. The Giants, of course, played the Cowboys and lost to them on Monday Night Football on September 26. Cooper Rush was their quarterback then. Dak Prescott since has returned. Paul Dettino on Lance Meadow. Talk to Cowboys play-by-play -play voice Brad Sham and gets the lowdown of what's happening down in Big D. Giants are playing on Thanksgiving for the first time since 2017, and this year they renew their rivalry with the Dallas Cowboys, who won the first meeting this season at MetLife Stadium in Week 3, 23-16. To get more into this week's opponent, we're now joined by the play-by-play -play announcer for the Cowboys radio network, none other than Brad Sham. Brad, you got Lance Meadow and Paul Dettino here on Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time today. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? Uh, you know, it's uh, Thanksgiving. How bad can it be? Happy to be with you guys. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you on the program. And, Brad, I want to start big picture perspective. We know the Cowboys had that rough loss to the Packers. Well, boy, did they bounce back and then some with the largest margin of victory in a road win in Cowboys history by beating the Vikings 40-3. to And 
This is now four games back for Dak Prescott. Last time the Giants saw the Cowboys, it was Cooper Rush under center. What has changed? What has evolved, maybe from an offensive standpoint, since the last time the Giants met the Cowboys? It's funny you ask that. I was talking to a couple of Cowboys uh, offensive players about that very thing yesterday, trying to get their opinion. The first thing that uh, kind of jumps out at you is personnel, uh, which wasn't just uh, Prescott, uh, although he, that's obviously an important part of their identity and what they do, but uh, they didn't have Dalton Schultz at all in that game. He had uh, sprained his knee. Now, he's not back 100%, but he's functional. Uh, they didn't have Michael Gallup yet. Um, uh, the young... Uh, the young left tackle, uh, Tyler Smith, uh, was in his third game. Um, and so there's a, there was a lot of stuff. And uh, they were really trying to survive, I think, at that point. I'm not sure they knew exactly what they were capable of offensively uh, with Rush. That would have been – that was week three, right? So that would have been his sure. second game starting. Um, so, and then you, you always hope, and I know the giants would say this, um, injuries aside, you always hope that by the time you get to week, uh, 10 or 11, you're a much more advanced football team in every respect, especially offensively than you were when the season started. So uh, I, I think they're, you know, whether they'll be good enough on Thursday, we'll find out, but. I think their their personnel's better uh, than it was in that game, and I think they have kind of evolved somewhat offensively. I don't think they're where they're going yet, but uh, but they're better. You know, your point about Prescott being back just however many games it's been. Uh, he and I don't. I'm not for playing the starters in the preseason, and he did participate in practices, but. Um, you know, he didn't he didn't play well in the first game, and then he got hurt, and then he missed the next four, five. So he came back against – I'm doing this from memory. He came back against Detroit, and I, I didn't think they really opened up the offense. They kind of they kind of gave him enough to make sure he could function, and then they were better against the Bears. And then, uh, I mean, offensively, they, they needed to do more than they did and they had an opportunity to do more than they did uh, in Green Bay. And then Sunday they were pretty good. So that's I think he's he's not in week 10 form. You know, he's in, he's in about uh, the start of the second quarter form, you know, week five or six, something like that for him, for what he's played. Well, Brad, given what you've just said about Prescott and obviously some of the passing game elements coming back into the lineup that did not play against the Giants in week three, I'm thinking the Cowboys are going to go into this game emphasizing the run for two reasons. One is the Giants' rush defense has been very inconsistent. And two, as I look at Dallas's numbers, it was back in week three when Pollard ran for 105 and Elliott ran for 73 that was their most potent rushing duo combination game of the season. Would you agree or not agree that they would well, be would heavily agree. on the ground game? Yeah, I would agree that would be their starting point emphasis. But um, I think the reason, the main reason is that's, that's who they are trying to be. That's who they said they wanted to be when the season started. Now, what Pollard has been able to do uh, has – kind of reinforce that feeling, I think. But I, I think it, um, you know, football teams always tell you it's not about them, it's about us. Um, and then when they get into the game, they still have to play to what they're facing. But having said all that, I, I do think that it, it's not because the Giants, what the Giants have done against the run so much as it is, they just think that's that's their best way to function offensively and it makes the passing game a little bit more efficient they're adequate at wide receiver but they're they're not the best in the league by any means and when you have then good runners who can help set that up i think that's the way to go and i think that's how they feel
Brad, Paul brought up the rushing numbers from that week three matchup against the Giants. And you look at Tony Pollard, it's not just what he's doing on the ground. It's what he's also doing as a receiver. He's got 100 plus scrimmage yards in each of the last four, and he has six scrimmage touchdowns since week eight. So clearly it seems as if Kellen Moore is emphasizing to get him more touches. And I know Cowboys fans, I believe, were calling for him to get the ball more. What exactly are they doing? What has changed that they're now focusing on him more? Is it the Zeke injury that helped accelerate that? Or is it the fact that they believe they can tap into this unique skill set here? You know, I don't think it's changed so much as it is uh, evolution. Um, he, it's not like he's never caught the ball. He was mostly a, a receiver in college. Now you can make the uh, assertion that he's a much better runner than pure receiver. But the, the Sunday was a good example of how one of the touchdowns, the passing touchdowns to him, uh, when they watched Minnesota tape, they thought they had a chance to get a matchup that they liked. And so, you know, it's, it's a swing pass, uh, a wheel route, uh, but they were able to identify the defense and get the matchup that they hoped to get. And then you just put the ball on him. He just catches it and runs. So it's not intricate, but it, it's kind of situational. I, I don't think they've changed. They've just given him the ball more. You know, Elliot missed some time. Uh, Elliot was really running well. And he's still running well, but he does. He's look, he's a seventh year back who leads the league in touches since he came in the league in 2016. There's not a back going, maybe Derrick Henry, but I'm not sure he's human. Um, there, there's not <laughs> really not a back going who has the explosiveness that he had, uh, in year seven that he had in year one, especially when they touch it that much, that's, it's just too punishing. And that's not the nature of the beast right now. Pollard's in year four and four years from now, he won't be as explosive as he is right now, but he is right now. So their challenge has been to find the best way to use both of them. And they're working on that. They're, they're starting to get in that direction. I think, I think uh, part of what's going on with Pollard the more touches is partly because of the games that Elliott missed. Funny thing is the game that he, that he hyperextended his knee um, was either Detroit or Chicago. He came back in the second half after having that injury and, and scored twice and had one of his most explosive runs of the day. He's still very powerful and he's good in, in um, close spaces. He's a different style runner. So I, I think they're, they're using them both, you know, I mean, Saquon, for instance, is an, is an unusual guy. And it's probably who uh, Elliot wanted to be thought he was when he came in and very few of them get to year seven and eight and are still carrying it 30 times a game. A lot of us were brought up thinking that's what a lead back does. And we might just need to, that might've gone the way of, um, uh, past defenses and and uh, the shift in baseball and I mean some things just change. Brad, let me go back to what you mentioned uh, about uh, Smith was kind of green at left tackle when they played the Giants back in Week Three. But overall, I'm looking at a, a, a stat line that says only 14 sacks allowed through the first 10 games of the season. So I ask you, is that because the game plans have gotten the ball out quickly? Is that because the offensive line has performed much better in pass protection than maybe people thought they would? Or is it also part of the fact that the Cowboys do lean a lot on the run game? Yeah, I think all three, but you can't lean on the run game either if, if you can't block. I mean, I thought the best part of their performance on Sunday in Minnesota was the offensive line. They scored the first seven times they had the ball, and a, no Dallas team had ever done that. And um, and the quarterback was 22 out of 25. Lot, not a lot of deep stuff, fair enough. Not a lot of, you know, seven-step drops, but there aren't many of those anymore. Um, and, and there, you know, were some plenty of good holes to run through. So, you know, I, I think the offensive line is, has also evolved. Mike McCarthy talks a lot about September football. I'd never really heard 
the term in a coaching context before he got here, and I'm beginning to understand what he means because we've all seen how the game has changed, and most of us think not for the better since 2011 when the CBA was redone and and uh, strength and conditioning coaches couldn't get their hands on players in the off season. Number of padded practices is reduced. I understand why the union wanted to do all those things, and it has not necessarily made the football better, and certainly not at the beginning of the year. So I, I think that a lot of times early, this is, I mean, one of the things the Giants have done best, I think, is find a way to win some of those games early while you're trying to get everyone flowing together in ways that you once would have done in training camp and preseason. I mean, I think we're all old enough to remember when players played in preseason. And now preseason is for the rookies and the guys trying to make the team for the most part. So that that first part of the season is about trying to survive and maybe flourish a little bit and find an identity. Uh, the Giants really did it extremely well, and it's got them playing meaningful games here at this part of the year. Cowboys lost their quarterback in the first game and, you know, they were confident in Cooper rush, but they couldn't have possibly known that the defense would play as well as it did. And that rush would play as well as he did and that they would come uh, out of the first uh, four games that he played winning them all. So what's that have to do with the offensive line? I think you're just all growing. You're, you're, you know, you were starting a rookie at left tackle. You were starting a left guard who, um, although he's in his fourth year has because of injuries, never been able to play consistently. You're starting a third year center and, um, and your right tackle is in his third year and he's an undrafted free agent. He's the guy you like, but he, he, I mean, these guys have all got to grow up and grow together. And so I think that's happened with their offensive line. And I think that those statistics that you're quoting are a little bit of a reflection of that. We're talking with Brad Sham, play-by-play announcer for the Cowboys Radio Network. Brad, you brought up the defense, and I want to flip the script there because clearly Micah Parsons has been a disruptive force ever since he arrived in the league, and we can maybe get more into him. But I actually want to talk about two guys that I think have been nice complementary pieces because they have four players with at least five sacks. You look at Dorrance Armstrong has seven. Dante Fowler has five. So those two have combined for 12 sacks, and they probably don't get nearly as much attention as – Micah Parsons and Demarcus Lawrence. How key have those two in particular been for Dan Quinn's unit? Well, Armstrong, uh, I think, really has. And, you know, there was a big controversy down here when they, for whatever reason, they wanted Randy Gregory back and they thought they had a deal and then they didn't. And so they lost him. And uh, some of the money that they were going to give to Gregory, they used on Armstrong. And um, I mean, because he's a really good special teams player and he's long and and um, the, the, he, he would fit into anybody's team. He's not necessarily a star, but he's a really solid player, would fit into anybody's team. And so that's been an important piece for them because they paid him kind of like a starter and he has played up to that. This uh, He'd been several weeks without a sack and the sacks are great. We all love to see him. But that's just a statistic. You can lead the league in sacks and and only play 17 games. Uh, what you have to have is uh, consistent pressure and disruption, and you have to be able to set the edge on defense uh, in the run game, and that's something that they had not been doing very well. Fowler's been a pass rusher all his life, and that's why he was the third pick in the draft. But there's also a reason that he's on his fourth team. And some of it's injuries. Um, and he's had a couple of, he's had a couple of uh, penalties that uh, were ill-timed and not really what you want. And um, I, I think he's a role player. And he, for the most part, has played his role well when they put him in positions to go outside that role. I'm not sure, it, I'm not sure everybody benefits uh, the way they like. But in, in his role... Obviously, he's been good because he can still rush the passer. That's he's he's always been able to do that, and and he can still do that. And so those have been important parts that 
you know, they're still trying to figure out what to do with Parsons completely. I mean, sometimes, look, they didn't draft him to be a pass rusher. If you saw him at Penn State, I did get a chance to see him in college, did a bowl game that he played in. and um, He's one of the most amazing sideline-to-sideline guys you've ever seen. But what the reason that people have uh, buzzed about him since last year is Demarcus Lawrence got hurt, and they, in an emergency, said, "Let's let's see about you rushing the passer more and we've seen what's happened um and he's still immature he's still a young guy still learning uh but he's uh, clearly an unusual talent so people have to know where he is and that kind of gives that gives those armstrongs and fowlers an opportunity to make some more plays as long as they are playing within the structure of the defense i think they might have all not those guys in particular but i think that the whole group might have gotten away from that a little bit uh, being as disciplined as they needed to do when when they were giving up 200 yards a game rushing two or three weeks in a row, and if they, that's something that they're going to have to keep an eye on for as long as they play. Brad, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Demarcus Lawrence uh, a few moments ago because in that game in Week Three that Dallas won, when when Diggs picked off a pass with about a minute to go, David Sills had slipped, and that sealed the the uh, touchdown victory uh, for the Cowboys. DeMarcus Lawrence was by far the most dominant player on the field that night when he really gave Evan Neal, the Giants rookie right tackle, an awful lot of trouble, hit him for two of his three sacks. And and I just wonder about how important he is going to be in this game. Maybe not necessarily Micah Parsons, but Lawrence, who ruined the Giants last time they played. Yeah, I think Lawrence is uh, one of the most important players on the field whenever they suit up. He's He's one of the best run players I've ever seen. And sadly, the money and the attention, except from coaches, but the money and the attention all goes to guys who produce numbers, who are big pass rushers, and that's those are the highlights that are shown. That's what we talk about. Demarcus Lawrence, first of all, he is the conscience of the room. He's the leader of the defense. And he is seriously one of the best run players I have ever seen and takes a great deal of pride in it. And he's got the explosion to be a, a really good pass rusher. And he's battled some injuries. He's battling some now, but they're all battling some now. But he, I, think he's, I think he's a really super critical, important player for them. And uh, he means a lot more to them than just the statistics that he produces. I mean, he's... That's money well spent by them to have him here. Brad, you were referring to the run defense, and the Giants had 167 rushing yards in that week three game. And you mentioned the struggles that have popped up over the last few contests. What, in your estimation, is that a product of? Is that the fact that they've been maybe a little bit banged up at linebacker? Is it the fact that the guys, when they don't get after the quarterback, are not able to finish off the edge? What would you pinpoint as to why that has been a bit of an Achilles heel for this defense? Well, I think the uh, I, I, I now, of course, it was only week three, um, but I really think that their um, their problems against the run. I don't I don't know if it's right to say they started in that game, but they were certainly manifest. And you can check my math because I don't have the stats in front of me. But uh, if they gave up, a, if the Giants had 160 something yards rushing in that game, I'll bet you Daniel Jones had almost half of that. And, you correct. Yep. And for a while, uh, so, I mean, they didn't handle him well at all. And then um, when they gave up 200 plus to the Bears, uh, that was mostly, but not exclusively, but mostly Justin Fields. Now, a lot of people are having trouble figuring out how to defend Justin Fields. So, and then obviously Jalen Hurts is his own set of problems. Now, that doesn't mean that they haven't been susceptible in the running game to uh, conventional running backs. And certainly that was the case in Green Bay. Aaron Rodgers can still run around, but that's not how he's going to cut your heart out. And uh, it was running backs who did that. But um, th- And then here's what happens with statistics. So then people say, well, look, they really bottled up Dalvin Cook, and they did. But they also kept scoring. They got ahead. The game changes. You can't necessarily play 
the same way you might have wanted to play from the beginning. And uh, I don't think the Giants have any question. I don't think. Like, I know what the Giants are thinking. But it would surprise me if the Giants' approach didn't center around uh, Saquon and Jones uh, being able to run the ball. That that's the that's the thing. It seems to me that the Giants do best offensively, and especially with some of the uh, uh, compromises they've had in, in the injury department in the receiving core, including the tight end. So I would attribute a lot of it to the fact that they just got smoked by running quarterbacks beginning with Daniel Jones, and, and then I think they got a little sloppy, and I think they. Um, did not play um, technique the way they wanted to. And I'm not sure, I can't prove this, but I'm not sure that some of those guys didn't uh, get stars in their eyes over all those past statistics, those sack statistics that you were quoting before. They're young men and competitive, and they want to do well, and everybody's telling them doing well means sacking the quarterback. And that's not the only thing that that is doing well when you're playing defense. And uh, I think I think McCarthy said last Monday after they'd lost to Green Bay, uh, he said uh, pass rush is a privilege, and, and that means you got to you got to play the run. You can't you can't be decimated in the uh, running game. So I think all of those, you know, they're human beings and and they can play better than they did. In a few days, they didn't play so well. Uh, so I think all of those things were the biggest factors in why their running numbers were not good. You know, it's interesting. We, we are starting to get close to the time of the year when the statistics, the overall statistics that we will all quote mean less because they include parts of the season that are really not relevant anymore. And I wish that the league did a better, more accessible job of uh, breaking down team statistics uh, by quarter. I'd like to know what the last four games, what they've done. You can do it. You can figure it out. Um, But that, I think, is more relevant. So when we get out of this game, I think McCarthy said – He's, he is one of those coaches who likes to break the season down into quarters. I've known coaches who like to do that, and I've known coaches who did not view it that way. He's one who breaks it down into quarters. So I think he said, since we're on an odd number now, that uh, the five games they were embarking on after the eighth one uh, – that was going to be the third quarter of the year. So that's, that's where we are. And then when we get to the fourth quarter there, it'll be more important to me to see what they've done in the last four or five games than what their seasonal numbers are. They'll have more meaning. Well, Brad, my final question actually does revolve around the stat, but I think it's one that holds up no matter what time of the year you're talking about. And that is the turnover ratio because Dallas has only given up the ball nine times, and yet they are plus seven, which is tied for third in the NFL in in takeaway ratio. They have been really good at protecting it, and this even with the fact that Diggs only has three interceptions on the season. To, To have that good of a ratio and yet not have a ton of picks tells you how incredibly important of a value that they have placed on ball security. Yeah, there's no doubt. That is one of the that's one of the things they lead with, and and that's a great example of a statistic. Um, I, I read, you know, they led the league. I'm pretty sure they led the league last year in in turnover differential. It was the best. I don't know if it was the best they'd ever had, but it was close. It was some phenomenal number. And Diggs had, you know, 11 interceptions. You don't get 11 interceptions anymore. Most year, what what's the leader got now? Five. Well, Most years, four, yeah. Yeah, that's what you get, you know, seven or eight for the last 25 years that would lead the league. And but Diggs has played better. He hasn't intercepted as many, but he's played a lot better cornerback. The interesting thing that I saw early in the year was I I don't remember the exact number of years, but I think it was 10 or 15. The last 
that number of years going back, the team that led the league in turnover differential, the next year their differential dropped off. That's I can't tell you the reason for that, except that maybe a lot of these takeaways are circumstance, but no team has repeated as the leader in turnover differential for at least 10 years, and I think it's more. So it starts with exactly what you said. You can't give it up. Ball security is really important. And that's one of the things that Rush did so well when he was playing. And then Prescott came in, he threw two in one game. And so that's something that he has to be very conscious of. Uh, But that is number one, because uh, the worst – the worst thing, if you never turn the ball over, the worst that can happen is your stat line will be even. And then if you do figure out a way to take some away, and I think they're third or fourth or certainly top five in, in differential right now, and that's, that's good enough to compete. Would you like to lead the league in every statistic every year? Sure. But if you're in the top five or six in differential and you're not giving the ball away, you've given yourself a chance to win. And I, and I, I think you're a hundred percent right. They, they emphasize it greatly when McCarthy was in green Bay, they were really good at that. And he really prioritizes uh, ball security. And I think his first year here, they were terrible at it. And that, that really bothered him. And so he had to do a lot of things differently. And that's one of the things that they've done differently. And, better so they're yeah that's something that they're they work on to your point brad the colts were tied with the cowboys last season at plus 14 they're minus eight this year so yes teams have fallen off immensely very hard to duplicate that success so that puts the cowboys in a very unique territory before we let you go brad i want to turn to special teams because you can argue kickers can be weapons the giants have that argument with respect to graham gano brett maher is seven of nine in field goals of 50 plus yards He actually had to redo one against Minnesota, and the second one, you could argue, was better than the first one. So it just goes to show you how strong his leg has been and how reliable he's been. And I'm just curious, how key has that been, especially in circumstances where Dallas can't finish drives with touchdowns? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm really glad you brought that up because one of my favorite things after I've been doing this for a while, and and as you know, you get around teams, and there are always on teams that do well – there are always some stories that you really hope a lot of people get to know because they're just, they're great stories. So, you know, they had Maher before they had him, uh, they had Dan Bailey for all those years and he was really, really, really good. And some stuff happened and he had an injury and then he wasn't so good anymore. So they let him go. Then they couldn't find one. So they had Maher, I'm going to say three or four years ago. And he had the strength in the leg. I mean, he, he made a 63-yarder when he was here before. He's, he's always had a strong leg. And that, that last year they had him, I think it was 18, could have been 19, uh, he was a little erratic. You know, it's funny, if you look at kickers, um, I think the only place kick – no, it's not, that's not right anymore. But the, the first place kicker in the Hall of Fame – was Jan Stenerud, and, uh, and and I'm old enough to remember him. And if you go back and look at his statistics, I think he was like 50-something percent on field goals for his career, maybe in the 60s. Well, you if you're not in the 90s now, the, we can't win with you. So it's really changed. And so the thing of, about this team, so they go to training camp, and they, they'd had Greg Zerline, and he was erratic last year. They let him go. He signed with the Jets. Now, they don't know who their kicker is. And they had uh, a young fellow, uh, Liram Hyrulahu, who's been with several teams, been with them a couple of times. Canadian League kicker, really nice young man, just didn't have a great strength in his leg, and he was a little erratic. And then they had a, a kid uh, named Jonathan Garibay, who'd been a really good kicker, a rookie. Uh, been really good at Texas Tech, and he he sprayed footballs like they were coming out of a fire hose in in <laughs> training camp. And 
So they had no idea what they were going to do for a kicker. And at some point during camp, they had one of those bring four guys in and uh, Maher was one of them. And the city knew him. The team knew him. The staff didn't know him. They'd never had him. John Fossil had never been with him. So he had the best day and he signed. The only two field goals he's missed have both been from 59 yards. And I think he's had one extra point blocked and that's it. And he's just been so steady. It's a story that is the kind of thing that when sports is really good, that's the kind of thing that we talk about. It's guys who are good guys who, who uh, handle adversity, experience it, handle it. They're not all over the board emotionally and they're great teammates. He's just the same guy all the time. And I, in fact, I noticed, cause you know, we look at a monitor uh, also while we're doing the game. And I noticed after they, that ridiculous decision to make him kick it again, he, it was one of the few times I've ever seen him stop and take a deep breath. They, they did a close up of him and he stopped and he did a deep inhale. And I, so I talked to him after the game. I said, I don't think I've seen you do that before. Were you just, did you need to recenter yourself after that first one? He said, yeah, it was a little frustrating. I just want to make sure I was just right in the right. I mean, he changes, you know, and Gano does this for the giants. You, when you have a kicker that you trust, it changes offense. It changes the way you call the game because you don't have to get to the 30 yard line to have a chance. I mean, it may give you 10 yards of field position and um, then you have to take the weather into account also, which is one of the reasons they didn't try an overtime field goal in green Bay because he, the end of the field he was going to, the ball was just dying. It's cold indoors. That's not a problem. And so I think the Giants feel the same way about Gano. Uh, there are some of these guys when they're going good and you believe in them, just line, send them out there. 55 yards doesn't matter. Go. And um, I still get a little nervous when any team, uh, unless it's at the very end of the game or the half, tries one of those 50 plus because the field position you give up uh, if you miss it, it is punitive, but when you never miss, you kind of like your odds. And he, I, one reason I would like to see them continue to do well is that so more people will do what you just did and talk about him and ask about how did he get here? Cause no one saw him coming. And when they signed him in training camp, the rea- this is another reason I don't pay any attention to fans. <laughs> the, the reaction was, oh, God, him again? We're going to get him again? Well, you know, now now he could be elected mayor. So <laughs> that's that's how that stuff goes. But he's been a really good story. Absolutely. And that's how quickly opinions change, as you can attest to, Brad, in the National Football League. He is Brad Sham, play-by-play announcer for the Cowboys Radio Network as the Giants collide with the Cowboys on Thanksgiving for the first time since 1992. Brad, can't thank you enough. Greatly appreciate the time and the insight. Happy Thanksgiving and look forward to the game on Thursday. Yep, thank you guys. Thanks for having me. We hope everybody has a great, safe Thanksgiving. The Giants official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV, brings video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV and the Giants mobile app. We thank Brad Sham, the voice of the Cowboys, for joining us. Great work as always. And now we move on to Bob Papa with the head coach of the Giants, Brian Dable. It is with great pleasure I welcome in my co-host and the head coach of the New York Giants, Carl Banks, and coach Brian Dable. And uh, coach, short week for you. Got to put the game against the Lions to bed. How much can you really go back and study it? Yeah, we did that. We did that uh, right after the game as a coaching staff and uh, the coordinators watched it. I watched it. We got together, you know, over FaceTime and, and phone conversations that night and fixed the things we think we need to fix and then really get right on into Dallas. Coach, uh, when you look at the Dallas team and what you have to erase, we talk about short memories all the time, but it's not the physical now. It's making sure that the guys are mentally prepared and focused because the mental should click um, when the game starts because 
everybody's dealing with it on a short week. Yeah, um, you know, Thursdays, you always have to have a good schedule set in place for them. Uh, make sure that they're mentally right, but more importantly, they got to make sure they're physically right with their massages, their rest, their hydration, and and that'll be important for us this week. And and then they got to meet and you know study groups and and spend a little extra time on some of the tape. Unfortunately, this is a team we've played in our division, but uh, you know a lot that goes into it getting ready to play on a Thursday game. Coach, you mentioned playing on Thursday. It's Thanksgiving. It's a little bit different than your boilerplate Thursday night game. Um, what about the concept and the thought of playing on Thanksgiving, which is a, basically a national holiday here in the States? Yeah, it's a privilege. You know, all eyes are on you. Um, you know, I remember as a young kid sitting down and eating some eating some turkey dinner and watching football and hearing John Madden's voice. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great tradition. We're honored to be part of it. And uh, you know, we'll do our best to represent. Coach, um, the Dallas Cowboys, obviously, they're coming off a big win against the Minnesota Vikings. Um, you know, they have that one-two punch, Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott, and it really seems to be working well together where it's um, nobody's griping about sort of the snaps that they're getting. Yeah, and they're winning, you know, that's so true. usually that's, that goes hand in hand. Uh, both of them very talented players, really can do anything with them in the run game, in the pass game. Pollard is explosive, so is Zeke. Uh, he can get downhill on you. They can break tackles. They can take it the distance to the better backs in the league. And when you play a team that's as talented as uh, the Dallas Cowboys, both sides of the ball, discipline is really important, right? Being where you're supposed to be, not to turn what could be a decent play into a big play. Is that safe to say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, taking care of all the little things, but uh, this is one of the more talented groups that we face uh, really at every position. They're very good on offense, great in the kicking game, and uh, exceptional on defense. Uh, it would be a very tough challenge. Coach, um, the last time you played the Cowboys, Cooper Rush was the starting quarterback. Now you get Dak Prescott, but you know, you know what he brings to the table. What makes Dak such a strong player? Really everything. He's, he's good in the pocket. He's accurate. Um, He's got good tempo in and out of the huddle or when they go no huddle, uh, makes good football decisions, uh, can use his legs if he needs to, and he's a winner. Coach, on the other side of the ball, Carl mentioned about the Cowboys defensively and obviously with Lawrence and Parsons up front and then all the other guys that they have because they do it in waves. Um, is it really exotic what they do or is they kind of just – they can just beat you man on man. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think Coach Quinn does a really good job with this scheme, particularly into the passing situations. But, uh, you know, very talented individual matchups. They're hard to block, and uh, they got good cover players that take advantage on the back end, too. So it all works hand in hand. Uh, extremely talented defense. Go ahead, Carl. Coach, when you talk about the, the, the players and as you prepare their scheme and you talk about the individual talents, is it important to understand from, from your perspective, offensive line, to understand each individual player and what they do well before you even get into the scheme? Absolutely. Everything starts with matchups, and mm -hmm. you never know exactly where they're going to put him, uh, particularly 11. He's, he's kind of all over the place, mm -hmm. um, a dynamic player. And, you know, Lawrence gave us a lot of issues the first game and inside. They're just – uh, start with the matchups, and then we gotta, you know, we got to do a good job, too, with, with our technique, our fundamentals, and making sure we're sound. And I know that uh, you know Diggs pretty well yeah. uh, from way back in the day. Yeah. Uh, fun guy to go against, but a dangerous guy to go against. Absolutely. I mean, you, you see what he did against Minnesota. They matched him up and um, you know, held a really good receiver to three catches, I think 33 yards. Uh, you know, yeah, that's not fun. He's yeah. pretty he's pretty instinctive <laughs> player. He's got, yeah. he's got length. He's got speed. Um, you know, he's, he's a heck of a corner. Coach, just as you get ready to play this game against the Cowboys, um, you've got four division games coming up in a row. So the message to your team is what? It's right there in front of you. It's all in front of you. Whatever happened last Sunday really doesn't factor in right now. Yeah, it's really all about Dallas. Um, you know, we got a few days here to make sure we're prepared and, and go in there as fresh as we can be to play a good game on, on Thursday and Thanksgiving. All right, Coach, we look forward to spending Thanksgiving with you in uh, Arlington, Texas. Yeah, thanks, Bob. <laughs> That's Giants head coach Brian Dable. We thank him for joining us on this episode of the Giants Huddle podcast. We thank Brad Chan. We thank Mark Lewinsky as well for some good insight on the Giants offensive line going up against a really tough front this week in the Dallas Cowboys. The Giants Huddle podcast was brought to you by PSENG, energy efficiency for game time and any time. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. As always, we'll have a rapid reaction after the game, reacting to whatever happens, Giants and Cowboys, on Thanksgiving. Enjoy the game. Enjoy your holiday. Happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you next time on the Giants Huddle Podcast.